So I was sitting at my favorite reading chair doing some reading, but I had this idea stuck in my head about an Arduino fiction book. It's something that I'd been thinking about for years. Thing is, I love prototyping with Arduino, but I also love to read. So I'm like, what if we could mash these ideas together? Like Tex-Mex, we could make a fun fiction story about Arduino stuff. So I finally reached out to a writer who it turns out was an electronics geek at heart, and I told him about this premise that I had. What I realized pretty quickly was the story that I had in mind was nothing like the story that was being written. It was a whole lot better. So we hired an illustrator who had mentored under a Marvel artist to work on some graphics. At first, we were just gonna do like one picture per chapter, but then Josh, our video editor, thought, hey, these pictures are great. Let's turn this thing into a graphic novel. So we have a book or a graphic novel. It's about a washed up theoretical physicist who gets hired by a company of ill repute to build something he doesn't know. Along the way, he gets help from his electronics hobbyist dad and a coworker who's trying to solve a decades old mystery. What you're watching right now is a voiceover of the book. It's basically, this is an audiobook with pictures in it. Maybe this is like a pictorama. I don't know what you call it. Anyway, that's what you're watching. We're gonna be releasing chapters of this book on our YouTube channel. If you wanna buy the book yourself, and it's a great way to support our channel, just go to the link in the description. You can pick up the book on Amazon. The Kindle version's also available, and we'll be releasing the audiobook version there as well. If you know somebody who likes sci-fi, enjoys reading, maybe into Arduino stuff, tell them about the book. We'd really appreciate it. Well, without further ado, here is the prelude to the Arduino Paradox. The Arduino Paradox, Prototyper Chronicles, Index Equals Zero, by Mark Lambert, illustrated by Brandon Scribner, narrated by Brian Safara. Prelude, Black Institutional Coffee and the Liquid Blue Shockwave of Elysium. It was a shade past midnight. Not that the concept of time meant much in the eternally shadowless chromescape of a vast subterranean laboratory far beneath the streets of a sleeping city. A small group of tired-looking men and women huddled over a laptop. Clad in lab coats, they spoke in hushed tones as together they scrutinized a complex array of graphs, reports, and readouts. Every so often, one of the experimental team would lift their head to glance across to a man lying motionless on a stainless steel examination table in the center of the room. This man was the test subject. He was why they were here. No one there knew his name. They knew everything else about this man. His blood type, his weight, the length of his fingernails, the complicated latticework of his subtle neurochemistry. Each member of the team could effortlessly list off what the test subject had eaten over the last month right down to the calorie. But the test subject's name? That was information well beyond any of their pay grades. The test subject groaned, his back arched as he writhed on the examination table, and a battery of medical units strapped to his body screeched an electronic alarm. LEDs speckled across the visor covering the test subject's face, lit up with a brief violent display of electronics fireworks, and then went dark. Alarms sounded, computers spat out error messages, and complex machineries clustered on the laboratory floor ground to a halt. Lab coats rushed into action. No! The test subject's voice came out hoarse, the dry, cracked sound of a human who hadn't spoken in days. Then a medic's nitro-gloved hands hovered over his agonized form, clasping a syringe filled with a neon blue liquid shockwave of chemical elysium. Deftly, the medic punctured the test subject's vein and drove the liquid home. The sweat-drenched man sighed and lay back on the examination table. Tech personnel rushed in to remove devices strapped to the helpless man's body while medics stabilized him. A hush finally fell over the room. The experimental team stared wide-eyed at one another, chests rising and falling fast in the aftermath of their shared adrenaline-spiked freefall. Another close call had come and gone. The lead experimentalist sighed and slumped in a chair, exhausted. He pinched the bridge of his nose, 
and drained the last cold dregs of bitter black institutional coffee. Failure again at 57%, he said quietly. A scribe entered the result into a laptop. It was the latest in a long, long line of dutifully recorded disappointments. The lead experimentalist sat back in his chair and surveyed the exhausted faces of each member of his team. Then his eyes strayed across to the test subject, now blissfully unconscious, and at the beginning of another long bout of mental and physical recovery. This isn't working, he said. Heads around him slowly nodded. He lifted his gaze to the security camera in the corner of the room and saw that it was firmly trained on him. He stared into the abyss that lay beyond its lens and spoke to the ever-observing mind that lived there. It's time we came up with a plan B. Introduction, Ezekiel and the Bulldog Clip of Destiny. Dr. Ezekiel Trobador woke up to a shrill metallic beeping Again, he grunted in distress, half forming the notion that the noise had been happening for some time. Ezekiel, Zeke to his friends, of which there were three, including his dad, dragged a large, overstuffed Star Trek themed pillow over his head. Something sounding like the word no emerged from inside the pillow's warm, feathery innards. Time passed. The noise didn't. A trembling fist emerged from under the covers and slammed down on the faded red stop button of a vintage 1980s PQ-30 digital alarm clock. The noise stopped. A thin individual with a shock of unruly brown hair groaned, sat up, and looked around his bedroom. Scratching various parts of his anatomy, he reached for his bedside table and slid on an oversized pair of black-framed spectacles. Ezekiel, Dr. Trobador to his colleagues, of which there were currently none, glowered at the fractured artifact of vintage timekeeping electronica that now lay dangling on its cord like a criminal from the hangman's noose. 10.15 a.m. The alarm clock display flickered up at him in its last death throes. Late already. Again. Mumbling to himself about time and the questionable nature of reality, Ezekiel threw on a nondescript pair of baggy sweatpants. He chugged a glass of water over his kitchen sink, scooped the various parts of his alarm clock into a plastic bag, and stumbled outside his front door. It was Tuesday, and he was late for breakfast. Running his hands through his thick shock of frazzled hair and blinking his sleep-drenched eyes back into focus, Ezekiel scuffed his way up two flights of narrow, 60s-era apartment block-style stairwell. He tapped his knuckles on a familiar door, yawned, and stepped inside. Oh, yep, son. A waft of sizzling bacon assailed Ezekiel's nostrils. Jim Trobador emerged from a well-lit kitchen. You're late. Ezekiel's dad waved an oil-slicked cooking spatula in his son's direction. Yeah, late night. Looks it, Jim grinned. Come and help your old man make breakfast. Fifteen minutes later, Ezekiel sat at a small linoleum table across from his portly progenitor. He gazed down at a plate mountain of bacon, eggs, and an assortment of fried things he struggled to recognize. How was his dad not a small, cholesterol-fueled blimp? Jim raised an eyebrow and pointed a fork dripping with egg yolk at the plastic bag filled with alarm clock bits Ezekiel had placed beside him on the table. Problem with the old alarm clock? Yeah. Ezekiel mumbled around a bite of bacon. Yeah, It fell apart. Mmm. Just fell apart, did it? Jim's eyes narrowed. Mm, don't know what to tell you, Ezekiel said, shoveling a bit too much egg into his mouth. I just gently pressed the stop button. Uh, maybe old electronic devices aren't as reliable as you keep going on about. Jim grunted, then mumbled nerdish things about resistors, and he poked through the dead clock's plastic casing and dusty circuitry with his butter knife. It'll take some work, but I'll fix it for you he intoned. 
An unsettling glee crept into blue eyes twinkling from beneath gray, bushy eyebrows. I picked up a new soldering iron the other day. It'll be perfect for this job. Remind me to show it to you later. It's a real beauty. I can just use my smartphone, Dad. It's got a built-in alarm, volume controls, and everything. I'll fix it for you, he repeated, raising his yoke-drenched fork to signal the subject was now closed. Conversations like these always ended the same way. The two ate in silence to an old rerun of MacGyver, far better than the newer version, Jim assured his son loudly and often. When their enormous mountains of food had become molehills, Jim cleared his throat. <clears throat> so, Ezekiel's shoulders tightened. How's the job hunt going? Dad. Now don't get all uppity, Jim said as he got up and cleared the plates. A man's allowed to ask innocent questions about his son's vocational prospects, isn't he? Silence reigned as MacGyver fixed a helicopter with a coat hanger. Isn't he? Ezekiel Grudge nodded. He wished he could explain. For years of his life, his gaze had been fixed on one thing to the exclusion of all else, including hygiene, money, and relationships, though not always in that order. The moment he started his PhD in physics, Dr. Ezekiel Q. Trobador knew, with every fiber of his bespectacled being, that he had something new and original to say. No one, himself included, understood exactly what he had proven when he submitted his PhD, neatly bound and in triplicate, to the Academic Assessment Board. Blending metaphysics with physics and Zen philosophy with a mountain of quantum mechanics, Ezekiel had shown, conclusively, mind you, that a causal phenomena were real. What did that mean, precisely? This was a question Ezekiel had become all too used to hearing. When pushed to simplify, Ezekiel would explain that it meant that an event, and the stuff that caused that event, could happen backwards. At first, Ezekiel could only prove it at a minuscule scale. A subatomic particle could move because it bumped itself. But step by logical step, he bridged the gap to the world at large. By the time his thesis came back from the printer with its classy purple faux leather cover, Ezekiel was able to present a string of mathematical formulae that demonstrated, as surely as 2 plus 2 usually equals 4, that a person could know something in advance because it was about to happen. It also meant, theoretically at least, that you could build a device that responded to a future input because it was going to happen. That's where things got interesting, in a final flourish, his thesis proposed an experimental method that anyone could reproduce with basic electronic components. Rather grandly, he named his theoretical invention the Synchronostic Effectuator. The consequences of Ezekiel's study were ridiculous and far-reaching, if a little bit terrifying. Everyone agreed it was a triumph of intellectual inquiry, but there was a problem. No one knew quite what to do next. And then the world just moved on. And when the awards and acclaim didn't arrive, Ezekiel found himself lost and aimless, not quite willing to leave academia, but just as unwilling to dive into a more practical existence, where money, girlfriends, and hygiene happened. Again, not necessarily in that order. Jim sighed rubbing his hands on his The A-Team apron and looking concerned as only a father with big eyebrows can. <sighs> Listen, son, I'm not going to pretend I understand your PhD stuff, he said, making annoying air quotes in the air around the acronym. But you're wicked smart, and if you could just... Dad... No, hear me out. Maybe a real job is what you need right now, you know? to dust the cobwebs off that massive brain of yours. You've had your head up in the clouds so long. I had a real job. I was a theoretical physicist. But I mean real, real. Like in electronics, or at a hardware store, or something. You know, where you make and sell some normal stuff. 
Jim trailed off as his son stood up from the table. The pair walked together to Jim's front door. Jim squeezed the taller man's shoulder. Sorry, son. I was out of line. Ezekiel pushed his glasses up his nose and squared his shoulders. Nah, you're right, Dad. It's time I got on with life. I'll start looking for work tomorrow. Promise. Ezekiel smiled, a twitch at the corner of his mouth betraying how hard the words had been to say. You gonna fix that alarm clock for me, right? You know it, Jim beamed. As Jim's door closed behind him, Ezekiel plodded back downstairs, feeling a few pounds heavier around the stomach and a few pounds lighter around the shoulders. Maybe a job at the local hardware store might be fun. He half pondered, but that was for later. His immediate plan was to digest his breakfast while catching the rest of that MacGyver episode. Ezekiel opened his apartment door and stepped inside. Something crunched underfoot. He looked down at a large yellow envelope around his room as though some invisible roommate might materialize with a simple explanation. He picked the envelope up, feeling its bulk. Definitely not junk mail. A chunky bulldog clip in one corner hinted at the hefty seriousness of the document therein. He flipped the envelope over. Attention, Dr. Ezekiel Q. Trobador. Confidential. Ripping it open, Ezekiel gazed down at a cover letter printed on crisp legal paper. He squinted at the embossed logo. It looked a bit like a stylized LED, its two uneven prongs piercing a globe of planet Earth. Dear Dr. Trobador, we would like to offer you an internship with an exciting new electronics prototyping program. Your starting salary will be $50,000 per year with a generous bonus package effective on completion of the program. Confused, he scanned down the page past a few solid paragraphs of corporate policy gobbledygook to a closing signature scrawled in big, confident cursive. Tigron Hesk, CEO, Protojo Corporation. And then underneath the signature block, a postscript penned with the same crazed chicken scratching. P.S. Your first day is tomorrow at 9 a.m. Don't be late, Dr. Trobador. Get a better alarm clock if you have to. Your company handbook is attached. P.P.S. Oh, and ditch the track pants. Ezekiel blinked. How odd. He felt a shivering thrill as he set the packet down and gazed out his window at the quiet tree-lined street below. Oz and effect. Practice and theory. Old MacGyver, new MacGyver. It all swirled in his mind as he pondered the strangeness of fat yellow envelopes. Ezekiel unclasped the bulldog clip of destiny. Maybe a job at the local hardware store could wait. Chapter 1. Clifford and the Dreadful Indoctrination Ezekiel strode across Proto-Joe HQ's black marble floor, wishing he wasn't wearing a bright orange tie. Catching a glimpse of his reflection in polished glass, he grimaced. Thrift shop business slacks and a baggy checkered blazer, borrowed from his dad, didn't exactly help a failed physicist in big glasses blend in here. He glanced at the vintage Casio CA53W calculator watch dangling loosely from his clammy wrist. 8.45 a.m. At least he was early. Dr. Ezekiel Trobador. Ezekiel announced to an official-looking man sitting at an official-looking registration desk. Ezekiel couldn't help noticing that the man's tie was of a distinctly non-orange shade of official gray. He also wore an official badge on his lapel with a Proto-Joe logo. Printed beneath it in strictly no-nonsense Helvetica were the words Robert, Official Lobby Liaison. The word official was neatly underlined in red marker. Ezekiel concluded the man before him was an official of some kind, and he was probably named Robert. Robert stared back at him blankly. I'm the intern? You're the intern, Robert repeated. Yes, I start today? 
You're the intern and you start today? This is what you're telling me? Robert, official lobby liaison, flicked his eyes downward, and Ezekiel heard the whispered click of a keyboard. A flash of grudging recognition swept across Robert's face. Oh, you're the intern. His inflection made the words sound like an unusually smelly treatment for athlete's foot. You're late. We have no time to lose. Before Ezekiel could think of a business-like response, Robert had circled his desk and affixed a plastic badge to Ezekiel's lapel with a large letter P on it. Please follow me. Robert marched Ezekiel to a gleaming elevator, punched in a long sequence of numbers, and ushered him inside. What does the P stand for? Ezekiel asked, hoping his voice wouldn't betray the hot bubble of nerves in his butterfly-ridden belly. All will be revealed in the fullness of time, Dr. Trobador. Good luck. The elevator doors hissed closed. Then came the familiar swooping lurch of acceleration as Ezekiel rocketed skyward. An astronaut on a bold new mission, equipped only with a silly badge, an orange tie, and a battered satchel containing a bulldog clipped staff handbook and two cheese sandwiches. Ezekiel glanced at his Casio CA53W calculator watch. 8.55. At least he was still early. The doors hissed open, and Ezekiel stepped into a large meeting room buzzing with fluorescence and filled with row on row of seated people with neat hair and earnest faces. First day faces. They sat facing a severe man in a gray suit, his expansive cranium beacon-like under the bright lights. The bald man's head beamed while his eyes glared. A few participants glared, too, because it seemed the right thing to do. You're late. My apologies. Ezekiel cleared his throat and adjusted his glasses. <clears throat> My um, iguana had a medical emergency. Please take a seat, Dr. Trobador. Scanning the room, Ezekiel saw a row of nervous-looking people with P badges. Whatever the piece stood for, Ezekiel guessed that he and these individuals faced a similar corporate fate. Come what may, these were his tribe. He crossed the room and sat down beside an efficient-looking woman with a non-dad-owned jacket, a corporate hairdo, and a shiny new clipboard. My name is Mr. Clifford Papillon. The bald man raised his chin and performed a ceremonial hand flourish. Procuring a marker from his top pocket, Clifford turned to a whiteboard and drummed his point home, writing his name out in crisp, clenched cursive. He turned to his audience and pointed at his name. Heads nodded. He turned back to the whiteboard, markers squeaking out the words, Company Indoctrination Session 1.0. He looked at his work critically, adding a neat underline beneath Indoctrination. Turning back to face the room, Clifford took a small sachet from a trouser pocket and tore it open, carefully extricating a cleansing tissue. He cleaned his hands with great focus, inspecting each digit for errant drops of ink. Silence hung thick in the room. The clipboard-wielding woman sitting next to Ezekiel turned to face him. It's awful, isn't it? She whispered. Pardon me? When one has an alien iguana... Oh, well, yes, definitely. It's... Ezekiel tried to imagine how a hypothetical iguana owner might feel if their hypothetical iguana were hypothetically sick. It's just a matter of taking it one day at a time. What's his name? Come again now? The iguana, its name. Ezekiel dug deep. Iggy. What's wrong with him? Uh, gas. Severe flatulence. It's a whole thing that sometimes happens with iguanas. The woman nodded gravely, then extended her hand and smiled. Felicity. Felicity Turbot, prototyping Class D. Ezekiel shook her hand. He glanced at the P on her badge, and realization flickered across his frontal lobe. The P stood for prototyping. At least that was one puzzle solved. And you are... Um, Ezekiel. Ezekiel Trobador. Prototyping 
intern, I guess. Felicity frowned. Intern? I could have sworn Protojo shut down its intern program years ago. Quieten, please. I can't abide rabble-rousing. Clifford had completed his cleansing ritual. He folded the tissue into a neat square, reinserting it into its tiny envelope before dropping it into a trash can. Felicity tapped her copy of the staff handbook and cleared her throat. Ezekiel rummaged in his bag for his copy. Nice tie, by the way. Thanks. For those of you who were late, Clifford glanced in Ezekiel's direction. I am Protojo's head of HR. As per company policy, it is my professional and contractually obligated duty to extend you a warm welcome to the Protojo family. For the next two hours, Clifford Papillon walked his audience through every painful line of the company handbook. Felicity took notes. Ezekiel tried to take notes, but his pen stopped working halfway through vending machine etiquette, and his will to continue breathing stopped soon after that. His eyes wandered to the back corner of the room. A tall woman with bright purple hair leaned against the wall, muscular arms crossed. He blinked. The gaze she had fixed on him made Ezekiel feel like a butterfly pinned to cork. He looked away. Time lost all meaning as Clifford's indoctrination 1.0 descended over the newcomers like a gray, moist blanket. Ezekiel daydreamed, drifting back to days that were filled with discovery. His research proved that humans could break the shackles of cause and effect. He'd been a titan then. Every day, he chipped away at the basic assumptions that held a Newtonian universe together. He'd questioned a universe that must unfold like neat causal dominoes, toppling each other with such boring and linear predictability. He was the John Wick of experimental physics, the Bob Ross of speculative psychology. And yet, here he was, sitting through a lecture about pencil shavings, toilet paper, and printer toner. There was a shift in the room. A palpable wave of relief swept through the crowd. Does anyone have any questions? Clifford had finished his onslaught. Clifford waved one hand at Ezekiel. Dr. Trobador, you appear to have prominently circled a section of your page. This is hardly the time to be shy. Is there anything you'd like to ask as our new intern? Clifford made finger quotes in the air around the last word. Ah, uh, well... Ezekiel glanced down at the coffee ring on his page. I was just highlighting the section on appropriate vending machine etiquette so that I can revisit it later. He glanced sideways at Felicity in desperation. Clifford clicked his tongue. Well, you all have your assignments. Please proceed with haste. Everyone else in the room bustled off to their new working life in the protojo corporate machine as those with pea badges gathered together like small, frightened, orphaned ducklings. Ezekiel glanced across to where the strange purple-haired woman had been. She was gone. Prototypers, follow me. Clifford strode from the room, a captain of industry in sensible loafers. The bald man led the group through a maze of corridors that seemed to get dimmer, narrower, more separated from the real world of sunlight and sandwiches and comfortably elasticated pants. One by one, the P contingent were dropped off at their new cubicles until it was just Clifford and Ezekiel. Turning one last dark corner, Clifford stopped and turned to Ezekiel. For the first time, his thin lips twitched into a hint of a smile. Dr. Trobador, I've been instructed to station you here. Ezekiel stood in front of a gloomy room with a scenic view of a fleet of dilapidated photocopiers. An office? Most observant of you, Dr. Trobador. Yes, this is, in point of fact, an office. He opened the door and ushered him inside. But I'm just the intern. Our CEO, Ms. Hesk, was quite clear in her instructions. Please commence work, Dr. Trobador, starting with your non-disclosure agreement. Dr. Ezekiel sat at his desk. Neat boxes of electronics were stacked on shelves on one wall. 
A protege motivational poster greeted him on the other. Stock photo footage of a team of scientists vigorously agreeing over a bar chart. Innovation, the poster proclaimed in bold type along the bottom. Ezekiel sat at his new chair. It squeaked in protest. He could empathize. On Ezekiel's new desk sat an enormous contract. He scanned the first few pages of the non-disclosure agreement. He got the general gist like he got a case of the mumps when he was eight. The meaning was clear. If he ever uttered the word protojo to a soul outside of this building, a large number of things would go very badly in his life. He reached for his shiny new fountain pen and signed his name on the dotted line. A man in a dark suit scurried in and scooped up his contract, depositing a slim envelope in its place. Dr. Ezekiel Q. Trobador picked up his first briefing envelope and tore it open. Welcome to Protojo, Dr. Trobador. We're all relying on you. Don't mess up. Tigron Hesk, CEO, Thought Test Pilot, Protojo Corporation. And beneath these inspirational words, Ezekiel found his very first assignment. We require a sequence of five flashing LEDs positioned horizontally. The unit should be small enough that it can be installed in a sensory blocking helmet. The frequency of flashing should be sufficient to produce a mild sense of sensory and existential dissonance. Chapter 2 Tigron and the Awkward Tuesday Okay, explain to me one more time what you do. Jim said, his words muffled by a mouthful of microwaved breakfast bagel. Ezekiel was beginning to regret accepting his dad's invitation to accompany him on his walk to work. It was another gray Tuesday morning, and one week had passed since his first day at Protojo Enterprises. Not much had happened since he submitted his first prototype late last week. The work had not been easy. While the electronics bore some resemblance to the exactitude of academia, both the sheer variety of semiconductors and the unforgiving nature of coding made him feel like he was back at school again. Still, it had been satisfying to feel new knowledge solidifying in his mind, like cookies in an oven. Other than prototyping, there'd been mountains of paperwork, of course, and more follow-up training by Clifford. If Ezekiel had to endure one more lecture about the PPP, Protojo Paperclips Policy, he might have to stick an officially endorsed regulation Protojo Paperclip right up Clifford's nose. Oh, and the week had been capped off by an awkward staff birthday party for a nervous-looking woman named Geraldine. The cake had been stale and an unsettling shade of neon yellow. One more time, then I'm done explaining this, Dad. Jim nodded his agreement a small chunk of bacon flying from his mouth and adhering to a nearby shop window. Okay, it's like this. Protojo is a giant international electronics company, and they pay people like me to make prototypes of... Ezekiel's explanation trailed off while he reached for a word that might resonate with a man of Jim's generation. They make uh, prototypes of gadgets for thousands of clients all over the world. And you're an intern there. Yeah, so you're an intern, and you make gadgets. Prototypes of gadgets. Jim Trobador mulled this over a moment, dabbing an errant glob of ketchup from his bright green Yoda t-shirt. The two men took a sharp right and gazed up at the glittering skyscraper of Protojo Inc., looming like a stern math teacher over an unruly classroom. Jim craned his neck back to take in the building in all its stern glory. He whistled in awe. A small piece of fried egg achieved escape velocity. Sounds like exciting work, son. Ezekiel considered admitting that the high point of his week had been his decision to invest in a pair of less dorky trousers. I suppose you better get up there and make more gadgets. Ezekiel grinned clapped his old man on the shoulder and turned his gaze to Protojo's front lobby. But then he hesitated and turned back, his expression thoughtful. It is funny, though, Dad. The first task they gave me. Oh, what about it? 
The new client wanted a LED array for a sensory-blocking helmet. Jim grunted in recognition. Uh, a bit like the idea you were working on in your big fancy essay? Doctoral dissertation. Ezekiel corrected, his thoughts far away. But yeah, this client, whoever they are, wanted a light device that produced a mild sense of sensory and existential dissonance. Those are the exact words they used. So? It sounded familiar, so I checked my thesis. Jim gave his kid a sharp and daddish look. You don't want to get caught up in thinking about all that stuff again. No, it's okay. I'm fine. But that phrase, I use those exact words to describe my experiment design. His voice changed to a robotic timber as he quoted from his thesis, words that pain and regret had burned deep into his memory. Chapter 1, the first step in producing out-of-phase a causal awareness must invariably be inducing disorientation in the test subject, coupled with a mild sense of sensory and existential dissonance. Lost in thought, Jim chewed on the last bite of his breakfast bagel, scrunched up the wrapper, and shrugged. Coincidence. Sometimes words are just words. I guess so. Jim's eyes trailed off across the road, and his bushy eyebrows lowered into a frown. What is it? Ezekiel followed Jim's gaze to a nondescript black panel van parked across the street. Nothing. I just could have sworn I saw that van on our street this morning. He shrugged. You better get to work. The troubadour men parted ways, and Ezekiel crossed the threshold to his now familiar nine-to-five home. With shoes clicking and new briefcase swinging, Ezekiel crossed the shiny black lobby to the main elevators. He nodded at front desk Robert, who sniffed with studied haughtiness, and tapped a few buttons on his keyboard. The elevators hissed open. A massive figure stood inside, muscular arms crossed, clad in rivet glimmering riding leathers and an oil black motorcycle helmet. Ezekiel took two steps back. Good morning, Miss Hesk, Robert waved. The leather encased human nodded at him. Hesk. Ms. Tigron Hesk. Ezekiel's stomach clenched in knots of professional paranoia as he stepped in and stood beside the CEO of Protojo Enterprises, Inc. The doors clamped shut. Dr. Trobador, I presume, a voice said from deep inside the shiny black head carapace. Tigron pulled off the helmet and smiled down at Ezekiel. Whiter than white teeth gleamed under electric fluorescence. Her hair, purple before, was now an electric shade of cobalt blue. An enormous gloved hand reached out to shake his. Ezekiel felt his hand bones moving in ways human biology had not intended. I'm Tigron, and I'm so pleased to finally meet you. Before Ezekiel could respond, Tigron fixed him with a concentrated stare. Our client was very pleased with your first prototype, Dr. Trobador. Very pleased indeed. Something about Tigron's intensity was both vaguely inspiring and unsettling. Her way of speaking felt like getting a birthday card with only the generic printed well wishes inside. We're all extremely pleased with your work, Ezekiel, and we just couldn't be Prouder to have you as part of our big, all-seeing, and all-knowing family. I, uh, well, I'm really glad to hear that. Tigron nodded, and Ezekiel wondered if he might just have accidentally said something important. A few agonized moments of silence stretched across the air between them. Superlative, superlative. Well, just keep it up, okay? Stay focused. Eye of the tiger, Dr. Trobador. Eye of the tiger. This is a big project for Protojo, and all eyes are on you. The door hissed open. Ezekiel stepped onto his floor. Tigron took a small step forward and placed her booted foot against the door. It buzzed in protest. Her electric corporate gaze of managerial authority doubled in intensity. If there's anything you need to excel, Dr. Trobador, you need only ask. Is that understood? Yes, understood. 
All good. And the particulars of your completely standard non-disclosure agreement are clear, I hope? Ezekiel nodded, crystal clear. And you're fully informed on the not insignificant financial, legal, and professional consequences of not complying with your non-disclosure agreement, Dr. Trobador? The elevator bumped against Tigron's boot. Fully informed. Um, you can rely on my complete discretion. He'd heard that last bit in spy movies, and it always sounded convincing. Superlative. Tigron produced an envelope from her jacket and held it out to him. Ezekiel reached across and took hold of it. CEO and intern locked for a Polaroid moment in a strange little exchange of power. You're doing great, kiddo. She let go of the envelope and smiled a bleached white smile as the doors began to close. Ezekiel paced the endless progression of tight, packed cubicles, a sea of blank corporate faces avoiding eye contact. He hesitated at his office door and kept walking down the dim corridor. He took a left, then a right, and glanced around to be sure he was alone. He leaned his forehead against the cool, smoky glass of an ancient soda vending machine and sucked in a few deep breaths of processed office air. What the heck was that about? Ezekiel took stock of his situation. A little over a year ago, he'd been neck deep in research that unlocked the door to a richly weird universe. And no one had cared. Then he had drifted, formless, in a void of his own making. And then... A letter arrived. Fate slid under his door, and suddenly he was here. Just a guy wearing sensible pants with two cheese sandwiches and a Walmart briefcase. Here, in an enormous high-rise office with an enormous boss with bright blue hair and hands strong enough to manhandle a rogue silverback gorilla. Hi. Ezekiel jumped, jolting his head on the vending machine. He turned to see a familiar face. Oh, hey, Felicity. I was just grabbing a drink. You know, from this vending machine here. He pointed at the vending machine. Great. Good for you. Felicity gave him an encouraging thumbs up. So, how is he? Come again? Your iguana. Has his condition improved at all? Oh. Oh. Ezekiel wondered why he was so bad at Tuesdays. Yeah, he, he's doing much better now. Felicity Turbot cast a quick glance over her shoulder to make sure they were alone. Ezekiel, we need to talk. But not here, she whispered. You? Uh, Felicity, I'm... I'm the kind of guy who likes to keep his professional and romantic lives separate. He heard that in spy movies, too, and figured it was worth a shot. <laughs> it's nothing like that, she scoffed. It's just that I discovered something, something odd. Let's have dinner, your place, Friday. He agreed. She left. He made it back to his office, a human cocktail of sweatiness, relief, and exhaustion. Ezekiel collapsed into his office chair, rubbing clammy hands on his new pair of fancy office trousers. People, he reminded himself, were much harder than quantum physics. After the back-to-back -back weirdness of Tigron and then Felicity, Ezekiel wished he could sneak away to the solitude of his little apartment. But there was work to be done. He fished the now soggy envelope Tigron had given him from his pocket and tore it open. His second prototyping assignment had arrived. Great work, Dr. Trobador. We now require you to create a series of seven chevron lights. On depressing a button... If the test subject fulfills our experimental requirements, the chevron display should signal a reward response, lighting up and staying on in sequence from light 1 to light 7. It is imperative that the lights produce a rapid but perceptible sense of movement. Our research indicates that optimal test subject learning outcomes occur when lights progress in an interval of 500 milliseconds. The prototype should be robust enough to permit rubber shielding, as the final product will need to function reliably when used in close proximity to a high-voltage e-stim unit. Chapter 3. Felicity and the Iguana Epiphany 
Another week sailed past. As each new day at Proto Joe Inc. unfolded, his feelings of unease grew like green mold on grainy bread. All the other people who started work with Ezekiel were distant silhouettes, off on their own paths, safely encased in their own cotton wool prisons of protocol and procedure. Ezekiel, meanwhile, toiled away in his gray little corner, like a corporate ghost with a fondness for cheese sandwiches. It felt as though Proto Joe's stern world of gray walls and scuffed linoleum were closing in on him. For all that, the prototyping had thrilled him. Every time he felt he learned something, a new concept leaped out from the shadows and yelled, Boo! But despite the steepness of his learning curve, something about prototyping felt comfortable and familiar. Almost like the cozy sensation of returning to a street you grew up on. He still experienced a constant state of befuddlement at how Arduinos made their magic happen. But he was beginning to see circuit boards, jumper leads, and lines of code as new friends. Ezekiel finalized his last prototype that very morning. Three neutral-faced people with white gloves had picked the device up from his desk. They avoided making eye contact, which had been just fine by him. At 5 p.m. sharp, Ezekiel packed his electronics away, snapped the cap shut on his pen, and centered it on his desk. In a couple of hours, Felicity would be meeting him at his place for dinner. His stomach churned. What was this thing she needed to talk about? Jim, of course, offered to make them dinner. Ezekiel agreed, partly for the moral support and partly because the contents of Ezekiel's fridge consisted of three-day-old takeout, two sticks of butter, and a gelatinous fur-colored orb that may once have been a tomato. Ezekiel stepped out of the elevator into the lobby. Oh, you're leaving then? Ugh, Robert. The official lobby liaison's face was contorted with official disapproval. Well, it's Friday at five, so another week working for the man and all that. Ezekiel turned to go. I prefer to leave at six, chimed Robert. A lot can happen at the end of the week, Dr. Trobador. Have you contemplated that? Last minute emergencies? New instructions? His voice trailed off, and he arched an eyebrow meaningfully. Okay, then. Good food for thought. Definitely something to ponder. Have a great weekend, Robert, he said over his shoulder. The street corner outside was bustling with closing time traffic. Ezekiel eased the tension out of his neck and glanced at his watch as a black panel van slowly pulled into the street beside him. Relieved to be back out in the real world, Ezekiel began his now familiar evening walk back to the comfort of home. The doorbell rang at exactly 7.01. Ezekiel jogged to his dad's front door and opened it to find Felicity confident and upright, clutching her gleaming black leather briefcase. Come in, come in. Jim's head appeared from the kitchen, followed by the rest of him, which happened to be encased in a vintage Wonder Woman apron. Felicity, is it? I've heard all about you. Jim ignored Ezekiel's pained expression. Dinner will be ready in a few minutes. Ezekiel, show Felicity around. Tell her about my new soldering iron. Dad, she isn't interested in your... Oh, what brand? A weller. Jim flashed Ezekiel a triumphant look. The SP-40? Nah, I lashed out. Got the WLSK-80 series soldering station. Felicity whistled. Jim beamed and disappeared back into the kitchen. The chopping and pot-banging sounds ramped up. Well, first things first, Felicity said, swinging her shiny black briefcase onto the dining room table and opening the clasps with two satisfying snaps. She pulled out a crumpled brown paper bag and thrust it into Ezekiel's hands. Um, what's this? Antacid tablets, cricket-flavored, a one-month supply. Wow, great. I was all out. What a lovely gesture. Felicity rolled her eyes. Therefore, your iguana. I have a friend of the pet pharmaceutical game. I made some inquiries on your behalf, and she informs me these are perfect for helping medium to large iguanas with digestive complications. Give him three tablets daily, and let me know immediately if things worsen. The kitchen had gone silent. 
Ezekiel knew his dad was listening. Oh, I will, Ezekiel croaked. Thank you. That's very thoughtful. I'm sure Ezekiel reached desperately to recall the name of his completely fictitious iguana. I'm sure Iggy will appreciate it. Is, uh, that the serious thing you had to talk about? Felicity shook her head. No, I'm afraid that's somewhat trickier. Felicity sat down at the table and pulled a single piece of paper out of her briefcase, carefully placing it in front of her. It had proto-Joe letterhead. Ezekiel sat down too, suddenly feeling a good deal more worried. Just then, Jim burst into the room carrying three steaming plates mounted with a wide variety of his favorite life-shortening foods. Enough talk of business, you two. He glanced at his son and mouthed the word iguana. Ezekiel shook his head. Let's eat. The trio ate and small talked, although Jim and Felicity did the majority of the talking. Ezekiel just listened as the two vigorously agree that the original Dark Crystal movie was vastly superior to the TV series. Felicity pushed her plate aside with care. She turned to Ezekiel, leaning forward a little. Ezekiel, may I speak plainly? She glanced sidelong at Jim. Ezekiel nodded. She's asking if you're okay talking about business stuff in front of your old man, Jim explained. Oh, yes, he knows all about Proto-Joe, prototyping and whatnot. Okay, good, good. Felicity shot a grateful smile at Jim and placed the paper in front of her. She plucked a pen from her jacket and took her time lining it up precisely alongside the page. It suddenly dawned on Ezekiel that Felicity was stalling. She was actually lost for words. He was surprised that could happen. Tension filled the room then, like a thousand semi-inflated gray balloons squeezing into every available space. The light from the bare light bulb above them seemed to grow dim. Three differently odd people huddled over a suddenly ominous sheet of paper. Felicity cleared her throat again. <clears throat> Ezekiel, the day we met, you mentioned you joined Protojo as part of the intern program, yes? That's right, Jim jumped in. He got an offer clear out of the blue. It was just sitting there under your door, wasn't it, son? Yeah, that's right. It was kind of a strange coincidence. I just decided I needed a job, and like Dad said, the job offer was just there. Felicity nodded. I see. She picked up her pen and clicked it a few times, a nervous tick. Here's the thing, she said, her voice almost apologetic. There is no internship program at Protojo. There was one way back in the 70s, but Protojo stopped any kind of entry-level program when the company began to accumulate big clients who, uh, let's just say they were the kind of clients who didn't want inexperienced interns blabbing to the world about their business. Well, maybe they just heard about Ezekiel's work and decided they'd restart the program to get someone of his caliber working for them. Jim beamed at his son. With all due respect, Jim. Felicity paused. Can, can I call you Jim? Jim nodded with a big grin on his face. Just don't call me Shirley. Felicity smiled and continued. With all due respect, Jim, there's no way a huge mega corporation like Protojo would pluck a physics academic with no electronics background out of obscurity to offer a prestigious and well-paid prototyping internship. It just doesn't track. Okay, it is odd, Ezekiel said slowly, lost in thought. But what does it matter? It's just a job title, right? Well, yes and no, Jim responded. Sometimes you just gotta trust your nose, right? If something smells fishy, sometimes you gotta go find the stink. Jim nodded at Felicity knowingly and tapped the side of his nose, leaving a small smear of mustard. Exactly, she pointed at Jim with two finger guns. Your odd situation got me curious, Ezekiel, so I did a bit of digging through Proto Joe's files. Are you a hacker? Jim whispered eyes wide. Did you hack their mainframe? Ezekiel rolled his eyes. Dad. No, it happened, son. Remind me to play that movie Sneakers for you sometime with Robert Redford. Amazing movie. Oh, oh, what about War Games with Matthew Broderick? Felicity chimed in. 
I have it on VHS, Jim said, proudly adjusting his apron. No way, director's cut? Focus. Ezekiel rapped his knuckles on the table. Sorry, where was I? Yes, Jim, I hacked their mainframe. If by hacking you mean rifling around in the HR shared drive during my coffee break. She slid the piece of paper between Ezekiel and Jim, who both leaned forward to examine it closely. Official communique from Tigron Hesk, CEO, to Clifford Papillon, head of HR. Mr. Papillon, we've discussed this verbally three times, and still I see no progress. So I'm now officially requesting on company letterhead that you immediately prepare the necessary papers to onboard Dr. Trobador with extreme haste. Our client has assured us that money is no object. Our client has also reminded me that its future financial support is 100% contingent on Dr. Trobador's involvement. As I stated in our conversation in the elevator this morning, I categorically do not care that this is extremely irregular. Nor am I concerned about what title you give him. Make him an intern for all I care. Offer a generous entry-level executive salary. One he can't refuse. And have this individual report directly to me. Have his contract completely airtight and liaise with the security team to initiate standard compliance protocols. This is business critical, Mr. Papillon. I advise you to pursue this as your top priority if you wish to remain in gainful employment with Protojo Inc. Cordially, Tigron Hesk, CEO. Whoa. Jim muttered, grabbing a potato chip from his plate and crunching on it. Yeah. Felicity agreed softly. What do you think she meant by standard compliance protocols? Jim asked. I have no idea, but it doesn't sound good. Ezekiel removed his glasses and polished them on his shirt. His face had turned an odd shade of grayish. So, to summarize, a shady client company I know nothing about is pressuring Protojo to employ me, specifically for this project. Felicity nodded. And I'm actually a pretend intern in a pretend internship program working for an enormous and terrifying purple-haired woman who rides a Harley Davidson and who probably wrestles bears for a light cardio workout. That just about sums it up. Felicity agreed. Where does the iguana fit into all this? Jim whispered. Ezekiel ignored him. An uneasy silence crept back into the room. Somewhere outside, a dog barked. A quiet tap, tap, tap echoed above as a neighbor in the upstairs apartment crossed her kitchen floor in high heels. I read your thesis, Felicity said unexpectedly, studying Ezekiel's face for a reaction. I read about your thought experiment. What did you call it again? The synchronistic effectuator? Do you really believe you discovered a way you could train someone to think backward in time? It's all theoretical. Ezekiel said quietly, but yeah, in theory at least. With the right external stimuli, it should be possible to condition a test subject to manipulate physical reality outside of linear time. It'd be something simple at first. An electronic device of some kind? Felicity asked. Yes, that could work. And how would you begin making it a reality? She asked. Well, you'd start with a simple sequence of lights in some kind of visor, just a passive display. Once the test subject watched the pattern closely enough or long enough, you'd introduce a reward response. Felicity steepled her fingers and stared at Ezekiel. She'd arrived at her point. It was the same realization that had dawned on Ezekiel earlier that week. This client, who or whatever they were, wanted to make Ezekiel's thought experiment a reality. Wait, Jim said. This client is paying you to make your invention? That's a good thing, right? I'm not so sure, Dad. I'm not so sure. A shady company messing with the time-space-time continuum is a bit like... a bit like... Biff stealing the almanac? Felicity offered, sensing Jim might resonate with a Back to the Future reference. Got it. Jim said, You're worried they're messing with powers they could not possibly comprehend. He looked at Felicity, and she nodded her approval of his deft Indiana Jones rejoinder. It was getting late. 
Ezekiel walked with Felicity to Jim's front door. What do you think you'll do? She asked, fishing her car keys from her briefcase. I'm not sure, Ezekiel admitted. Maybe I should quit? Felicity shook her head. Don't do that yet. They're nowhere near the end of your experiment. See where this leads. That's my advice. Somewhere deep down, you're as curious as I am. I know it. Felicity? Hmm? I have a confession. Oh? I don't actually own an iguana. Felicity laughed and began to make her way down the stairwell. I know, she called back over her shoulder. The bag is full of candy. I was just messing with you. After helping Jim clean up, he made his way downstairs to his apartment. He wasn't particularly surprised to see a crisp red folder marked Urgent, neatly thumbtacked to his front door. He took the folder inside and opened it to find a single sheet of paper. Of course, his next assignment had arrived. We are ready to progress to an interactive device. We need a test subject data input unit. A simple conventional keypad will suffice, connected to a remotely stationed array of LED lights. The data entry unit should allow the test subject to enter a button corresponding to five variables, designed as follows. PA, PR, F, PP, PF. It's imperative that the unit should be simple and intuitive to use, even during episodes of heightened emotional agitation. Chapter 4 Ezekiel and the Acronyms of Perplexity Ezekiel sprinted down a dark and winding corridor, or at least he tried to. Critically hampered by a day-glow orange novelty bunny suit, his flight soon slowed to an ungainly scramble. Panic rose in his chest, novelty rabbit ears flapping wildly. Ezekiel wove through an endless maze of cubicles, desperate for a glimpse of the green exit sign and the door that would lead him back to the real world. A furnace roared behind him. Like searing waves of hell's own fury, he felt the focused and dreadful rage of his pursuer somewhere behind him. It was close. So close now, raggedly ravenous breaths echoed along the corridors. Were they his? Or did they come from the other? There was no time. Ezekiel knew his only chance now was to hide. Skidding to a clumsy stop in front of a meeting room, he scrambled with oversized paws at the door, staring wide-eyed into the shadows. Somewhere near, heavy, booted footsteps picked up their pace from a walk to a run. The knob turned. He burst inside, but it was too late. It was here. Ezekiel slowly turned to face his doom, and he was back in college. He stood now in the front of a lecture theater, bunny-gloved hands clumsily scrawling formulae across an enormous blackboard. He was right back where it started. The chalk crumbled in his hands, formulas floating away to powdery oblivion as he tried to explain a new kind of universe. The ideas were so clean and clear in his mind, but the blackboard was filled with the jumbled and gibbering nonsense of a madman. He turned to his students. A thousand enormous leather-clad figures sat silently in the lecture theater, observing him, each wearing a shiny black motorcycle helmet. The lecture theater door blasted into splinters. Ezekiel screamed as Clifford Papillon burst in on a gleaming unicycle, bald head gleaming, face smeared in hellish clown makeup. Juggling three flaming calculators, he steered directly toward Ezekiel, his eyes aflame with an infernal Molotov cocktail of professionalism and malice. Faster, Dr. Trobador! The mono-wheeled HR manager screeched as the behelmeted behemoths rose from their chairs and walked toward him. We need to go faster! I I'm trying! He screamed back at the crazed corporate clown as a cacophony of alarm bells pierced the air. Ezekiel bolted upright in bed. Forehead, glistening with sweat. His newly repaired vintage 1980s PQ-30 alarm clock squawking. Ezekiel silenced the alarm and sat on the edge of his bed, head in his hands. He grabbed his glasses and slid them onto his nose with shaking hands. Barefoot, he stumbled to the kitchen. He grabbed a glass of water and stared at the fridge, mainly because it was there. A flash of pink caught his eye. His eyes strayed to the small, sticky note he'd stuck there earlier that week. Five sets of initials greeted him. P-A-P-R-F-P-P-P-F. 
Ezekiel cast his mind back to his last assignment brief. The test subject should be able to enter one of those values, even during heightened emotional agitation. That's what the brief had said, in such matter-of-fact words. Heightened emotional agitation. He knew a thing about that. He stared again at the initials. Why? What was all this? Ezekiel shook his head and popped a handful of iguana antacid tablets into his mouth. Why did those initials seem so familiar? Ezekiel sighed heavily and looked out of his window. It was a rainy Tuesday morning. For all the strangeness of things and against all odds, it had been a pretty good week. He made the last prototype much faster than his previous assignments, hands reaching for tools before he even knew he needed them. Ezekiel felt that he was building a solid body of knowledge about electronics and prototyping now. Design concepts were coming to him with considerably less effort. He still tripped up occasionally, but every so often, a eureka moment would slice through his mind consciousness as easily as, well, as easily as the old ideas, the ones from a lifetime ago, when he thought of himself as a theoretical physicist. But even as the excitement of learning blossomed inside his supple brain, the complete weirdness of his situation was slowly grinding him down. He was on edge, and the nightmares were getting worse. Knowing the reasons behind things had guided his entire life until now. Yet here he was, employed by a company he couldn't understand, building a contraption he couldn't contemplate. And yet so much of this was familiar. He was building his device, the synchronistic effectuator, a device that could slowly coax a human into radically rewiring their understanding of the universe. It still felt ridiculous. But at some intuitive level, it was the only thing that made sense. His skin crawled to think of it. Somewhere out there, a test subject was being slowly pressured to bend reality in a way no one else could comprehend. Not even him. He couldn't let this happen. Not for a giant behemoth of a company he barely knew. It was wrong. Ezekiel placed his half-full glass of water in the sink and sighed heavily, frowning at the sticky note and those five initials that had tortured his mind for days. Answers floating just out of reach. And just like that, clarity snapped into place. He reached a decision. He just couldn't do this anymore. Ezekiel didn't bother to shower. He threw on his tracksuit pants and a battered old t-shirt and strode out into his apartment stairwell with his hair unkept and a brain filled with purpose. Twenty minutes later, Ezekiel was at Protojo HQ and standing at Clifford's office door. He rapped on the door hesitated a heartbeat, and strode inside. Ah, Ezekiel, I've been expecting you. Clifford Papillon was sitting upright at his desk, bald head gleaming. I'd ask you to sit, but I imagine you'll just tell me you prefer to stand. Ezekiel took a deep breath. I've been thinking about this a lot, and I just think... Clifford raised a finger. One moment, please. The older man reached out for his phone and tapped out an extension. He muttered something Ezekiel couldn't catch, and the tiny sound of someone speaking on the other end of the line responded at length while Clifford listened. Very well, the bald man responded. He lowered the phone back into its cradle and gestured for Ezekiel to continue. Look, as I was saying, I've been thinking about this, and I just think my being here is some, I, I don't know, some weird cosmic joke. I'm sorry to hear you think that. Clifford slid a brochure across the table. Have you considered taking a self-confidence course? Protojo offers a generous personal improvement program. Ezekiel glanced down at the glossy paper. It was titled, Make Confidence Your Co-Pilot, and featured a picture of a confident-looking person wrestling a stuffed grizzly bear. What? No! Images from Ezekiel's dream rushed back of Clifford in clown makeup, screaming atop his infernal unicycle. I'm trying to say, I can't be here anymore. I'm exhausted of all this. It would seem you're having some kind of emotional outburst, Dr. Trobador. Have you considered adopting a higher fiber diet? Regularity, I've always found, is the digestive bedrock of mental clarity. 
No! Ezekiel took a step forward and slapped his hand down on Clifford's desk. Just listen to me, will you? I'm trying to say that I... Ezekiel stopped mid-sentence as the door quietly opened behind him. He turned as three unfamiliar protege workers scurried in, each clutching a black spiral-bound folder. In silence, they lined chairs up along Clifford's office wall and sat with their folders on their lap. Ezekiel glanced sidelong at the three new arrivals. They regarded him with blank faces. In formation, the entities each produced silver fountain pens and held them gleaming and at the ready. Legal. They had to be lawyers. Then the energy in the room tilted again. Standing in the doorway, an enormous figure loomed, silhouetted in office fluorescence. Tigron Hesk, black belt in jujitsu and proud CEO of Proto Joe Inc., made her grand entrance. Heavy footfalls reverberating through the floors. She lowered herself on a chair beside Clifford and scanned the room with an unsettling smile. She looked equal parts samurai warrior and strange person on a bus who carries around a small vial of toenail clippings. Thank you for joining us today. I invited our legal team to join us, just so that we have all the information we need to make smart decisions. She turned to Ezekiel and smiled a cold, corporate smile. Cliff here informs me you have some great ideas about how to improve the Proto Joe corporate experience. Ezekiel opened his mouth. No words came out. The silence in the room deepened. Perhaps you have some questions for me? Tigron nodded encouragingly. It was now or never. I... I know there's no internship program. I never even applied to Proto Joe. So maybe you can begin by telling me why I'm here. You are the internship program, Dr. Trobador. This whole self-effacing humility act you have going is just one of the many things we all love about you. You've been a breath of fresh air to this company. Her smile evaporated as she turned to face Clifford, who, Ezekiel realized, was now perspiring slightly and looking distinctly uncomfortable. Hasn't he, Clifford? Oh, yes, a breath of fresh air. That is just one of the things we all love about you. Clifford parroted. He had the facial expression of a man delivering a eulogy who just swallowed a fly. Look, Ezekiel pressed on, determined to end things here and now. I just can't do this job. It's complicated, but for personal reasons, I really need to be not here. Tigron's smile remained fixed. She turned slowly to face the trio of lawyers, sitting quietly against the wall. The lawyer in the middle, a mousy-haired individual named Clarence, cleared his throat and spoke. I'd refer you to section six of your contract. Deftly, he flicked some pages. Dr. Ezekiel Questor Trobador agrees to waive any right to ending his employment with Proto Joe Inc. for a period of not less than one year and one day. Ezekiel shook his head. That can't be legal. Clarence looked offended. I assure you, our legal team is not in the habit of creating illegal contracts. Did you read this contract in full before signing? Ezekiel felt a hot burst of volcanic rage burst up from his innards and into his brain. Of course I didn't. It's 300 pages of gibberish and misery. For God's sake, I was an academic before you crazy people dragged me into this crazy corporate freak show. I don't belong here. I'll get a lawyer. I'll take this to social media. I'll, I'll... You'll do none of those things, Tigron said softly. She leaned forward and fixed him in an unblinking stare. I don't understand exactly what you did, university of yours, but I know it was important. And you gave up, Ezekiel. Her voice lowered to a whisper. Other people didn't understand what you had to say, sure. But it was you that gave up. You have unfinished business, and this is your chance to fix that. You should be grateful to us. We believe in you. Who is paying me to make this thing? Ezekiel demanded. That is privileged information. Tigron retorted. What do the initials on my last prototype mean? Don't know. Don't care. 
Ezekiel pushed down an explosion of frustration and anger as he stared at Tigron's now placidly smirking face. I just want to be done with you people. Tigron laughed a knowing little chuckle. <laughs> Too bad. She snapped her fingers. Everyone jumped. Clarence, give Dr. Trobador the envelope. Clarence opened his folder, retrieved a bright yellow envelope, and handed it to Ezekiel. His name was scrawled across the front in oddly familiar handwriting. Ezekiel opened the envelope and pulled out a greeting card. Congratulations! It said in big, bubbly, happy letters. Underneath danced a bright orange cartoon rabbit with enormous novelty ears. Ezekiel's dream came back in a flood. The frantic running in terror for his life through Proto-Joe's corridors. Big bunny feet slapping a ridiculous rhythm on the carpeted floor. He lifted his head up from the card and swallowed hard. How? How could you possibly know about this? A glittering smile of triumph illuminated Tigron's face. Great chat, she boomed, irradiating the room with her unique flavor of manic cheerfulness. I feel we covered some interesting ground today, everyone. Thank you. Everyone except Ezekiel nodded. Everyone except Tigron desperately avoided eye contact. And now that we're all clear on expectations, Clifford, I do believe you have some news for our bright and hopeful colleague. Clifford glanced at Tigron awkwardly. He reached into his drawer and procured a larger contract, bound at the top with an oversized bulldog clip. He dropped it on the desk in front of Ezekiel, and it thumped impressively. Effective immediately, your internship program is terminated. In recognition of your excellent work, we are promoting you to prototyping engineer first class, with a concomitant increase in pay and privileges. Ezekiel blinked and looked down at the card again. The orange bunny grinned back up at him, performing its happy little congratulatory dance. You'll also have access to a fully appointed laboratory, a team of support staff, a bar fridge filled with protojo approved carbonated beverages, and full access to protojo executive level stationery. With an air of ceremony, Clarence removed the white badge from Ezekiel's neck and replaced it with an even larger name badge. It was gold-plated, with Ezekiel's name embossed on it in protojo official typeface. Everyone clapped. Numb, Ezekiel followed Clifford to the elevator, where together they ascended to the eighth floor. There, his shiny new office slash laboratory waited. A sizzling, fast new laptop perfectly positioned at a ridiculously self-important mahogany desk. He collapsed into his ergonomically perfect chair as Clifford left and quietly closed the door behind him. This makes sense. Ezekiel muttered to the orange greeting card bunny, who still happily danced without a care. He glanced at the shiny new laptop and opened the email waiting for him. It was his next assignment. Congratulations on your much-deserved promotion. We wish to express our appreciation for your efforts thus far. Results have been promising. However, an unexpected variable has presented itself. Early tests indicate that it is unfeasible for the test subject to maintain the required levels of concentration for the effect to work. Our technicians therefore require access to a rudimentary LED illuminated speed selection interface. Our preliminary research indicates that eight speed settings will be optimal. We must move quickly, Dr. Trobador. Thanks a ton for watching. You can head over to Amazon to purchase this book. It would really help support our channel. Thanks a lot. Have a great one.